This is Pete Buttigieg, the former boy mayor of South Bend, Indiana, and the current boy secretary of transportation. On November 8, 2021, in the White House briefing room, Buttigieg attempted to answer a very important question from a very unimportant journalist named April Ryan. Um, can you give us the construct of how you will deconstruct the racism that was built into the roadways that you talked to the Grio earlier when you broke that information with us? Can you talk to us about how that could be deconstructed? For sure, yeah. So I think the question was, how will we remove the systemic racism that was built into America's roads? Frickin' clown world. I'm still surprised that some people were surprised when I pointed to the fact that uh, if a highway was built for the purpose of di dividing a white and a black neighborhood, or if an underpass was constructed such that a bus carrying mostly black and Puerto Rican kids uh, to a beach, or that would have been, uh, in New York was, was designed uh, too low for it to pass by, but that obviously reflects racism that went into those design choices. Okay, so are there really highways that were built with a racist purpose? Well, I can tell you with absolute certainty that highways, first and foremost, are built to accommodate the movement of motor vehicles, so probably not. And unfortunately, Buttigieg isn't offering any examples or specifics, he's just making a general statement, so it's not anything I can prove or debunk. However, we can investigate his statement about racist underpasses, because it's a claim that has been floating around for decades. Buttigieg is referring specifically to the Southern State Parkway in New York State, and the accusation is that the designer of the parkway, Robert Moses, was a racist. And he was so racist that he designed the parkway's bridges to sit extra low so that black and brown people in buses couldn't use the highway to travel to Jones Beach, one of the many public works designed by Robert Moses. And the origin of this claim comes from an anecdote in Robert Caro's Pulitzer Prize-winning book, The Power Broker, Robert Moses and the Fall of New York. And if you can't tell by the book's title, it's pretty biased against Mr. Moses. Here's an excerpt. Now he began taking measures to limit use of his parks. He had restricted the use of state parks by poor and lower middle class families in the first place by limiting access to the parks by rapid transit. He had vetoed the Long Island Railroad's proposed construction of a branch spur to Jones Beach for this reason. Now, the author, Robert Caro, doesn't provide any explanation or detail or even cite a source to back up those claims. For example, what year did Robert Moses veto the branch spur to Jones Beach? That would be helpful to know, considering that the railroad was constantly in financial trouble and at one point was in bankruptcy. Also, maybe it wasn't worth building, considering that Jones Beach is utilized only three to four months out of the year. But instead of putting it into any context, you're supposed to take his word for it. But trust him guys, he's a journalist. Now Moses began to limit access by buses. He instructed Sidney M. Shapiro, the chief engineer and general manager of the Long Island State Park Commission, to build the bridges across his new parkways low, too low for buses to pass. Bus trips, therefore, had to be made on local roads, making the trips discouragingly long and arduous. Did you see it? Did you see all the racism? So three points here. First, the book says that Moses limited access by buses on the parkways, which makes sense as the parkways were designated as limited access highways designed for passenger cars only. Second, it says that bus trips had to be made on local roads and that those trips were discouragingly long and arduous, as if riding a bus could ever not be long and arduous. And third, when Caro claims that Moses restricted poor and lower middle class families from going to the beach, Caro is talking about class, and Buttigieg made it about race. If an underpass was constructed such that a bus carrying mostly black and Puerto Rican kids uh, to a beach was, was designed uh, too low for it to pass by, that that obviously reflects racism. Remember folks, only black and brown kids can be poor. Just ask Joe Biden. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids. 
Anyway, in the film Misleading Innocence, Tracing What a Bridge Can Do, urban planner and Moses critic Lee Kopelman is shown a Jones Beach bus schedule from 1937. Boy, I haven't seen one of these in a long, long time. One way, 50 cents. All coming basically from Nassau County, one in Flushing, all white areas. And this bus schedule alone, with pickup points in all white areas, decimates the argument that mostly brown and black kids would be riding the bus to the beach. But let's keep going anyway. In an article titled, Do Politics Have Artifacts? Sociology professor Bernard Georges takes on the racist underpass claim not only by Robert Caro, but also by author and political scientist Langdon Winner. There is a suggestion that Moses has violated a valid standard of bridge building, a tacit or explicit norm, which elsewhere allowed buses and other high vehicles on such roads. But this, it seems, was not the case. In the USA, trucks, buses, and other commercial vehicles were prohibited on all parkways. In sum, Moses could hardly have let buses on his parkways, even if he had wanted differently. And that begs the question, what would be the point of making more room below these bridges? To accommodate buses and commercial vehicles that weren't allowed to travel on the parkway in the first place? How then should one understand that Moses built some 200 overpasses so low? U.S. civil engineers, with whom I have corresponded regularly, produce two simple explanations for the rationality of the low-hanging bridges. That commercial traffic was excluded from the parkways anyway, and that the generally good transport situation on Long Island forbade the very considerable cost of raising the bridges. In other words, Caro and Winner don't know what they're talking about. Furthermore, in an email to the fact checker at the Washington Post, Kenneth T. Jackson, a Columbia University historian says that the overpass story is not true. Caro is wrong, wrote Mr. Jackson. Arnold Vollmer, the landscape architect who was in charge of the design for the bridges, said the height was due to cost, and added, also, you can still get to Jones Beach by train and bus, as you always could. And in the film Misleading Innocence, Bernard Georges adds the following. Buses were not allowed in the U.S. on parkways by law. Also, as engineer Vollmer, one of Moses' men, wrote to us, the Long Island parkways, including low overpasses, were modeled on Olmsted's designs for Westchester County. So the racist version of the story is not plausible, really. So who are you more likely to believe? An author's statement lacking any citation or historians who actually cite their sources? Well, if you're choosing the former, I can't help you. So why did Mayor Pete even bring it up in the first place? Well, you know why. And yes, it was pointless for him to mention it because federal funds aren't going to be used to enlarge the clearance under a single overpass in New York. And even if they are dumb enough to throw money at it, it won't solve anything because there was never a problem in the first place. Anyway, that's it for now. Pick up some Let's Go Brandon merch while you're still allowed. Be sure that you're still subscribed to the channel. And as always, thanks for tuning in and I hope to see you next time. If there is next time.